Okay. You really take so we appear like ghosts? Oh, yeah, like really take advantage of, uh, you know, um, the wonders of technology. <laughs> Hells yeah. <laughs> okay, right. we're live. Are we live? We're live. We're live. <laughs> I hope. We should be. All uh, right. You know, we can do a, we can do a little check here. Let us double check. Yeah. Well, it won't show up for like 30 seconds, so we'll just be kind of sitting here like silently, kind of awkwardly. But, you know, it's good banter that they're all enjoying right now, probably. It's fine. We've good. Oh, yeah. Here we It's working. We're on. All right. Yes, Andy, you are getting that right. Um, he said that uh, that we were on Judd Greenstein's Change, um, which to this day is still one of his favorites of the festival. Me too, Andy. Yeah, that was definitely one of my favorites too. Uh, yeah, so those of you in the chat have already learned. Um, <laughs> Andy and I were at Neef North together in the summer of 2016, a wondrous summer indeed. Um, and maybe we can like get a little more into this when we do a post-show chat, but, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot to, to talk about. <laughs> Memorable summer for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but hi everybody. If you don't know me, uh, my name is Will Yeager. I play the bass. I'm going to be playing from Iowa City tonight and over here. Hi. Um, I'm Annie Jang, and I am playing from Greensboro, North Carolina. And yeah, Will and I met in 2016 at Neef North. And um, I mean, well, I think we'll get into this later, but something that is kind of unique and special about our relationship is that Neef North was, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but like kind of our gateway drug <laughs> into like new music <laughs> in a sense. Um, I, I played a lot of my first contemporary pieces at this festival, and it's just opened up a lot of really incredible opportunities and doors for me, um, long, long life-lasting relationships. And so, yeah, I'm so thankful to Niefnor for allowing us to share music with you all. Um, thank you to Andy Bliss and Megan Enan and the entire Niefnor team, um, friends and family. Oh yeah, we can do that because we're on Zoom. <laughs> I can also do this. Oh, yeah. Nice. Doing lots of Zoom. <laughs> zoom, Zoom, Zoom and all the way. So um, yeah, and so now um, I'm in Greensboro and I'm assistant professor of piano and piano pedagogy at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. It's been my, my first year of college teaching, which has been a whirlwind to say the least, especially with COVID-19. So yeah so yeah we'll take it away all right time for some music there we go All right, hi again, everyone, on this different camera. Um, do a quick audio check here. Uh, great. Uh, so Andy and I are gonna be kind of going back and forth. Um, we're each gonna be playing two pieces, so we thought it might be fun to, to ping pong a little bit. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna be playing tonight uh, is one of my favorite bass solos that I just recently learned. Um, we played on the recital a few weeks ago. Um, and I was actually, just remembering that this piece kind of has a, a direct connection in some ways to the uh, 2016 uh, at Neef North Summer Festival where Annie and I both were. Um, Chiarino, a uh, great Italian composer, um, pretty sure he's never written a bad piece. Not too many people you can say that about. Um, he wrote uh, three pieces that are somewhat related um, at least in name, if not in sort of compositional idea. Uh, and the one that was programmed in 2016 uh, was Esperazione del Bianco 2, uh, which is for, oh God, 
I wish I remembered. It's a quartet, like flute, clarinet, guitar, and something else. Somebody in the, somebody in the chat can help me out later. Um, but before he did that, he wrote Esperanza Ami del Bianco number one, which is the bass solo. Um, and like a lot of Shirino's music, it's pretty quiet. So do not hesitate to maybe turn it up a little bit, or even better, put on headphones.
you, thank you. Now I'm going to pass it to Annie. Pass the mic. And that was awesome. Um, I love Sharino's music. It's like you're in a like a mystical dream <laughs> most of the time. Um, so the piece that I'm going to be playing is actually a world premiere, which I'm really excited about. And it's written by a dear friend, Doug Hertz. And Doug actually went to Nifnork in 2017, so a year after me. Um, so we just missed each other. But we then crossed paths because um, I was doing my doctoral studies at University of Michigan, and Doug was just starting his master's in composition. And we actually did not meet through um, a class or in the hallway or anything like that. We actually, and Doug, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure we met through Samba Band um, because I was playing Surdu in a Samba percussion band at the time. And we were rehearsing outside because the weather was beautiful. And I remember Doug in the parking lot, like coming towards me and being like, hey, can I join this band? Like, can anyone play? And I'm like, yeah, sure, of course. And Doug had been playing in a Samba band before. So that was kind of the beginning of <laughs> our relationship. And um, this past semester, so sometime in October or November, Doug reached out to me. And he's now currently based in Brooklyn and asked if, um, if I would be willing to play a piece that he was going to write for solo piano. And of course, I said yes. Um, and so we've been working together and collaborating on this piece that was the originally titled actually Faulty Zipper. And um, when he told me the name of this title, I, for some reason, thought that it was like some kind of metaphor for life and that things weren't lining up together properly. And I was like, Doug, what are you trying to say about my life? But actually it was because um, he has to commute to work from Brooklyn and he didn't like how cars merging onto the highway were not zippering and merging <laughs> properly. So that's, and then we ended up changing the title to Caught Zipper um, because there's this motive that you'll hear and it gets kind of stuck or caught on this note. And um, so when, when the opportunity came up for me and Will to play this live stream concert, um, I thought this was a perfect opportunity to premiere Doug's piece since we both are alumni of Neithnor. And um, the original plan was that I was going to record this piece sometime this summer. It was going to be kind of flexible with timing. Um, so since I was kind of notified about this concert about two weeks ago, I've only really lived with this piece for about two weeks. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I think a piece is living and breathing and um, it's never really quite a finished product. And so we're still going through changes. We're kind of considering this like a soft premiere. Um, I was still getting changes this past Monday. So, um, but I'm really excited to share this piece with you all. It's a really fun piece um, and I hope you enjoy. So here it is, Caught Zipper by Doug Kurt. Thank you. 
Thank you, Doug, for writing that piece. Um, more to come soon. Who knows? It might take on many other forms, but that was the first one, and you all got to hear it. Thanks. Switch it over to Will. I feel like it would have been really fun if I had like an object and I like passed it to you, you know, and you like grabbed it from the other end. But darn. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, make sure I can uh, get the right. Where did I go in my own mix? There I am. Cool. All right. Uh, and now for something completely different. Uh, yeah, bravo, Doug and Annie. Sick piece. Um, I'm going to put Doug and I guess myself on the spot many moons ago. There was talk of some kind of double bass ensemble piece, so if people in the comments want to like help me go Doug into like revisiting that, we'll see. Um, uh, so the next thing I'll be playing is uh, Therops by Giannis Zanakis, um, which was written in 1976. Um, so we got some old music on the program too. Uh, pretty pretty wild piece. So uh, you know, pray to whatever deity you choose, uh, and I'll see you on the other side.
Oh my god. <laughs> uh, people for hear me? Last bit, I'm going to hand it back over to Annie. Oh man. I don't know. <laughs> Will, you're an animal. I've told you this before. I heard you play. So, people may not know this, but Will just gave his final dissertation in recital um, for his DMA. So, he's now ABD, which is awesome. And so, he did it as a live stream on Facebook and he played that as well. And oh my gosh, what an incredibly wacky and insane piece. Um, <laughs> I'm about to play something completely different. Um, now that I think about this, this program is actually like very Norfy in the sense that like it, anything kind of goes and it can go from pieces like Zanakis and serialism and really heady kind of stuff to what I'm about to play for you now, which is just kind of simple, beautiful music. Um, so just to give you a little bit about um, this piece I'm about to play for you, which is Gustave Le Grey um, by Caroline Shaw. And when, um, when I was thinking about programming for this performance, I mean, of course, I wanted to share music with everyone. Um, but I also felt like it was important to choose a piece that reflected the way that I've been dealing with these um, unprecedented times. And um, I think, yes, a lot of beautiful things are going to come out of this. Um, people are spending time with their family, their loved ones, um, having some time to reflect in words. But I think on the flip side, it's also good to acknowledge, or not good, but just to be aware of the fact that a lot of people are also having a lot of difficulties during this time, struggling, um, feeling sad, lonely, depressed, unmotivated, and unproductive. I mean, I've definitely been in that boat, I'm still in it, and I think a lot of people are, and um, it's okay to be in that kind of headspace. And so, actually, when I, when I got the email about this concert, I had not, <laughs> I had not actually really been practicing. I had not touched a piano other than my teaching, and I was kind of just throwing myself into that. And so I was thinking about repertoire. What the heck am I going to play? I knew I wanted to play Doug's piece, and I immediately thought about Caroline Shaw's Gustave Le Grey because it brings me so much calm. And um, there's so much chaos right now, and I just wanted calm. And it's this beautiful piece. Um, I think that Caroline Shaw, something that I love about her musical language is that she's able to find beauty in simplicity and even tonality, which a lot of people may not necessarily associate contemporary music with. And um, this piece, the title of it, Gustave Le Grey, um, Gustave Le Grey was a French photographer and he was really important in the development of um, wax negatives. So you were able to really create the fine detail in photography. And so in the beginning of this piece, um, she's so poetic with the way that she describes music as well. And next to the beginning tempo marking, it also says, like a photograph slowly developing on waxed paper. And um, it goes from this single note, which then blooms on into the interval of seconds to thirds, this chord, and it repeats this motive over and over again. And then you're on this like nine minute journey. There's a musical quote, a Chopin A minor mazurka, and people may be wondering what the heck is a Chopin mazurka doing in the middle of this? And I think um, Caroline Shaw, who is a contemporary composer, but has a lot of roots to Renaissance, Baroque music, and traditional music. And um, she finds this really beautiful way of marrying traditional and then reinventing to the new, which is also kind of fitting for our times right now as we're reinventing a lot of things. Um, and you'll hear how her piece, there's so many of these motives that are also coming from the Chopin Mazurka. And then out of that, we come back to this beginning motive that we heard in the beginning with that single note. And there's this comfort in feeling like we've come home. Um, and so, I don't know, this, this piece 
bring, brings me a lot of gratitude um, to be a musician, and I also just want to share my gratitude to Niefnorf, to all of you watching, my friends and my family who may be watching. Um, please consider supporting Niefnorf. Um, before I play this piece, also we're going to be doing a Zoom hang, kind of like an after party. Um, so please join us and continue the conversation if we haven't answered some of your questions. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a time to be grateful, to be kind, to be compassionate, and um, I hope you enjoy this piece. Caroline Shaw's Gustav Bouguet. Thank you. 
issue if you don't have like multiple inputs in you know um, okay the only problem is Annie going last is I already had a drink and she doesn't <laughs> I get it. Okay. Uh, well, I'll, I'll I'll go grab my drink later. All right. So we have uh, we have a few questions. Um, first one is from Luis. Hello, hello. It's been a while. And her question is: Is it more homey or a bit odd to be performing in your home spaces? Um, in parentheses, us composers are kind of in our natural environments insofar as we have home studios. Um, so. I don't know. It's, it's, it's definitely, definitely weird. Um, I, oh, we'll check the mic situation. I thought it, oh yeah, I thought it checked mine. What about now? Is it good now? I think it is. Should I start that question over? You can just not hear it and maybe everybody hears that our Zoom is broken, but we'll I could also use this time to grab a beer. Um, or. No, it should be working now, because Zoom is recognizing okay. audio. And if it's recognizing you, it's going to... Oh, I'm, I'm fine. fine. Okay. okay, so apparently I'm okay. Um, but Will is not. <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely weird performing in, at home. Um, I, I've, I've done living room concerts before, but there are people there. And so having to play to a screen where you're not getting any immediate feedback Actually, I'm really thankful that Will is here. <laughs> if Will was not here, I would feel even more awkward about playing, but at least like he's there. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's nice in the sense that like I'm home and I'm in a space where I'm comfortable and my fridge is like right there. Um, but I think it's that immediate feedback and not really feeling the audience's presence that, um, that is a little bit strange. I don't know what your thoughts are, Will. Uh, yeah, I do have them. I just want to make sure that the audio is back before I launch into a scintillating. Okay. Scintillating well, in the meantime, while Will is figuring out his audio, um, I do you kind of want to just promote Neathmorph again. Um, and please consider supporting, donating, buying a seat through Dots. Um, <laughs> yes, and Will is wearing the Neath North shirt. I am not. I decided to wear a onesie today. Um, yeah, but there's really cool. I like what they've done where you can sponsor a seat. So you can like literally see your, your dot that's on the web page and it has your name. Um, I, I got so much out of that festival and it makes me... Um, it makes me sad that it can't happen this summer, but there are also some really, really great things that are happening like this, the, the performances that they're posting daily, um, and things like that. So, so please, please consider supporting. Um, okay, question number two, since I don't know where Will went. Can you talk about how summer festivals like Neath North have impacted your growth as a performer? So um, we touched base on this a little bit earlier, but Neathmore was really my first kind of contemporary music experience. I was using it kind of as like, I'm gonna dip my toes in, and then by the end of it, I had like fully submerged myself into contemporary music. And for me, uh, I actually kind of have to thank um, Neathmore and thank just the supportive community of new music for um, kind of saving my career in music. I was so done with being a musician, actually. Um, I had just, I went to New York the first year after my DMA. And um, I just was, I was in a space where I didn't really know what my purpose was. And so I was just trying out all these sorts of different things. And when I got to New York, the, the, I mean, there are a few things that really 
um, got to me, but the mo most important things were how supportive everyone was. Um, I think I was so drawn to the people and how friendly and nice and um, open everything was. The other thing that I loved was experiencing kind of the process of music making, being able to collaborate with composers and really being a part of the process. As, as before, I was always kind of just handed a score. You learn the notes, you have your take on it, your own kind of um, in, things that you do with it. And so with, with having to actually collaborate with a composer, I was really, um, just pleased by that whole process. Um, and the other thing too is that uh, I finally felt like music had meaning. And I don't mean that in the sense that like works by Chopin and Beethoven don't have meaning, but there's a different kind of meaning. <laughs> I think um, with a lot of contemporary music. Um, and I mean, the thing that I remember the most was that the summer that Will and I were at Needy Thorpe in 2016 was the summer that there was a shooting um, at the nightclub. And the way that the, the community of that festival had responded to it and also the, the music that we had played in response to that was probably one of the most moving experiences that I had. Um, and so that kind of left this impression on me that um, you know, that music has to have some kind of meaning and there has to be the why of, you know, why are we doing this? Sorry, that was a long answer. Go That's ahead. Answer. <laughs> uh, I hope people can hear me now. Um, yeah, I just, I remember the Pulse situation too and I, I just, I remember um, a particular um, non-virtual North Space um, in which our dear friend and lovely, lovely human Dan Schreiner played something that I think he wrote um, just like that day or like the day before. Oh, he wrote it. I think it was somebody. Oh gosh. Because I know a composer wrote something too. Am I conflating? Yeah. That? Okay. Either way, it was, it was really, you know, it was a really, you know, impactful moment. And um, yeah, uh, I don't know. And then I remember, um, was that because I also was there in 2017, and I can't quite remember one. One, did we go? Did we actually go to Knoxville Pride and like hang out? Like as a we did. Activity? Okay, yeah, like that was. Yeah, that was uh, great. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so I, I, yeah, I just. Uh, what, what question were you answering, Annie? Sorry, I got kind of caught up. <laughs> Can you talk about how, how like summer festivals like New like, have impacted? Oh, oh my God, I could talk about this for days. Yeah, oh, this could be. We might want to carry this over to like our our yeah. post. Well, we do have other questions to get to. So, um, just to say that it's it's kind of funny that um, we're doing this together because basically everything Annie just said, like I would say the same. You know, like I, I decided to go to Neath North totally on a whim just because that I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee, and I I had gone to a concert the summer before and just remember really seeing some pretty wild stuff and was just like, I don't know what these people are up to, but I'm into it. Um, yeah, and like after like two or three days at the festival, I was like, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is who I am. This is like, these are my people and this is what I do now. And it was like that moment that I decided I wanted to go back to school to like study contemporary music, um, you know, which is why I'm here in Iowa, I don't know, so like, um, and it was also the beginning of a time of my life when I started to really try to think about myself as an artist, um, and not just sort of a journeyman, you know, more craft-oriented, like, player of the bass, which is totally, um, it sounds like I'm really distant, um, <laughs> Speak loud, or speak into the mic that, um, <laughs> hopefully this is better, like radio show, it was like, well now it's right in front of my face. <laughs> I know it, this makes me seem totally inept everybody, but 
And maybe Actually, I... there's a whole reason why this works. <laughs> maybe I am I adept. Had no I had no idea how to use OBS. Megan and Will just like made this whole thing happen. I was just like, sure, I'm gonna sit here. <laughs> Tell me when to play. Okay, well, I'm gonna do my best, sort of like Fraser Crane. Um, yeah, just to say, uh, okay, we got a resounding yes. Okay, we're. <laughs> I, I could talk endlessly about Niefdorf and, you know, like it's, it's there, you know, we live in a world in which a lot of like heightened and hyperbolic language is thrown around, but like I, I, it like totally changed the course of my life and like what I want to do with it. Um, you know, so that's pretty, that's pretty amazing. And it's, and it's not just because that wouldn't have happened, you know, it's not because I went to just any new music festival and discovered, I mean, it's a lot of about, a lot of about why that was, um, was really specific to Neve North and the people who have made it into the space that it is. Well said. Um, okay. Question three. Yeah, question three is for you, Annie. Yeah, this is from Kevin Doherty. Um, hi, Kevin. Does a recording of the Caroline Shaw piece exist? Yes, it does. Um, there's a few out there. I think the best one to listen to is actually by a pianist named Amy Yang. Um, Caroline Shaw actually wrote it for her, and she just released an album, um, I think of Schubert and this piece. So yeah, go check that out. Um, she has a really beautiful interpretation of it. I will say also that that Chopin quote, the what's actually in the score isn't the full Chopin mazurka. I played about half of the Chopin mazurka, um, Amy Yang plays the full Chopin Mazurka, but you could also play it um, just with like the first few measures of it, which is what's actually written. So I decided to play a little bit more because I think it is nice to have it in context of the piece. Um, okay, question four from Natalie. Hi, Natalie. Um, I'm going to totally butcher your last name, which is why I'm not going to say it. But this is for both us. You and I will. What would be the thing that you recommend most to aspiring composers and musicians in general during this time? Oh, good man, this is a loaded question. Um, Thanks, Natalie. <laughs> Just kidding. I, I, I have some thoughts too, but keep going. I, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about this because um, I think there's a lot of like panic at the beginning of this. And there was a lot of this attitude of like, we're going to put a bandaid on this really quickly and like figure out how to like get by. And I think we're past that point now. And we all as musicians and artists have to start thinking long term about what can we do to make sustainable careers and to still make music in a productive way that's engaging with audiences. And so I think a big part of this I'm actually doing a webinar on this on Friday through Francis Clark Center, if you want to tune in, um, is that we have to kind of step away from the idea of recreating, because we just can't, and more of reimagining. And what that reimagining looks like, I think, in my opinion, is, is what can you do now that you couldn't do before? So... I mean, this whole live stream thing actually for performances, I mean, it's definitely not ideal, um, but there are pros and cons to it. You know, I, I, the fact that you can actually interact and like I can answer your question in real time, like that's a really awesome thing that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do. Um, oh, I have echo, shoot. Before, but then you run into these tech problems. <laughs> um, your crazy reverb before so, was totally my fault because I had my headphones not on and it was picking up. You were getting a mini feedback loop. Oh, all right. All right. Everything's, everything's Will's cool. fault, so everything's fine. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, the live stream concerts I think is really great. The other thing, too, that, that I would, like, recommend people to do is, you know, this is, like, this is a time to create content if you can. Um, something that I have really valued from this whole experience, especially with online teaching, is that I've had a lot of my students record videos of themselves before we, we actually meet for our private lessons. And what that did is it gives them 
a whole bunch of video content that they could share with people, that they could use for certain things. Um, also, I mean, this is a time where we can actually kind of step away from the physicalities of, of playing and music making and think more, again, I was talking about this earlier, the why, like how can we dig deeper into um, kind of historical information about the pieces that we're playing, the composers, um, and all of that. I mean, yeah, I could go on for a long time. I mean, these are weird, weird times for sure, and we have to find new inventive ways to kind of get through. Yeah, I, I, d I want to, you know, do a plus one for everything Annie said sort of about the maybe, you know, the broader, more like emotional, like mental health kind of, the which is, I think, priority number one i mean i think what you should do right now is whatever makes you feel less bad um you know i think in our in our community there's been a kind of this discourse not that anybody's like i don't think we need to all necessarily agree but like at first there was a whole lot of like now you can write your symphony or your novel and it's like a lot of people who i you know i know are like it's like no you know like my win is like getting out of the bed and putting on pants um and like those are totally you know equal. I think what you should do right now is whatever helps you get through. And so for some people, you know, channeling anxiety into their you know their you know their making of you know whether it you know be it performing, composing, what have you, great. But a lot of us like it's really hard to f you know feel our most creative when we're like experiencing like a time of anxiety or stress, right? Like you know maximum like creative whatever kind of only is something that's a consequence of like all of the chakras kind of being in alignment with each other. Um, somebody who actually knows about chakras might take issue with what I just said. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, it's not necessarily that I haven't wanted to play bass or the, do this, that, or the other. It's just that I have, I've had no mode. Like I've been like intensely neutral and like, I don't, I, you know, of course I've had some dark days. Um, but I mostly have been okay, but I just haven't had any like energy or motivation to, to do stuff. And I think in my personal struggle is just like, you know, forgiving myself for that. So all that stuff aside, if you are in a place where you're like trying to think about what to do, and I think this is a great actually thing for the sort of a lot of the people in the Niefnorf and new music community, one of the few modes of activity that I feel like is still totally doable without being kind of diluted or lessened or like a poor like simulacrum in some way of what we're used to as noisemakers is the performer composer relationship. Um, I have like too many irons in the fire. Um, a little shout out to uh, Louise and who's there in the chat. Um, you know, we're finally like about to start working on a piece together. Um, Louise, who I also met in 2016, one of my good friends from that summer and has continued to be, be so. Um, of course, for solo pieces mostly, but it's like, I, I have, you know, I'm like, composers can send me sketches and I can make demos or I can like send recordings. Like, I'm curious about this technique or this preparation or the sound. Oh, cool. I'll just like improvise a little bit and like send you something. So that for me, that feels like, okay, like, that's basically what, the only thing that's different is that we're not in the same room together. And of course that's, that is ideal, but that is to me, that's like one way of doing the stuff that feels like I can still do it basically at the same kind of level or with the same effectiveness, um, even in this, this current moment. Um, so I, I would say, and I feel like that has a lot more value to new music people since that's for most of us, something that's kind of near and dear to our hearts. Um, so that's something yeah. I'm trying to lean into. It's just like, yeah, collaborating with composers even more. Yeah, I, I'm in the same, but I'm like leaning hard into that <laughs> um, because it's it's kind of been surprising actually that since all of this has happened, I, I'm, I've gone several um, emails and stuff from composers asking if I'd be willing to play their pieces or that we could collaborate on something. And the offer is still there, composers, if you still want to write something, I'm so down to, to collaborate. Um, so yeah. Do you but, want to write a yeah, piece well, for bass and piano? So that, like next time Andy and I can like be in the same room together? Like just man. saying, you know. There aren't that many good pieces for bass and pianos. There's there are like four. So like there's totally room. <laughs> really? You don't want to play Botticini? <laughs> never, never again. I just said four. The only two I can think of are by goodbye to Lena. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
just assuming there's one or two more. Uh, we yeah. should, we have some more questions. I, I, I feel really bad if we... Um, yeah, there's a question about the Zanakis. Oh, the Zanakis. Nick! Hey, Nick. Um, yeah, I do. I won't nerd out too much on microtonality. Um, another bass player <laughs> and pal... Um, pretty insane. The, I did my recital on a Monday, like two weeks ago, and then like two days later, another incredible bass player, Ross Whiteman, did his master's recital, and like we had, like we both played the Zanaka, so we both played this amazing Catherine Lamb piece, and so there were at least a handful of people who were at both recitals, and I'm just trying to think. It probably hasn't been since like the '70s at Darmstadt that like a bunch of people heard Zanaka's bass solo like twice in the same week. Um, uh. I think um, basically he, it's it's definitely in the family of his some of his other string solos. Uh, one of the violin solos, its name is forgetting me, and one of the cello solos. Basically, like what he's doing with those like crazy glissandi, it's kind of his um, realization of what he was some of the work he was doing with the like random walk, the brownie in motion stuff. Um, brownie in motion is basically oh god, somebody help me out in the comments, but uh, it's like. Uh, when atoms or cells it's like it's it's what they do kind of it's it's like stochastic but it's like how they respond to each other like in in their space um oh, that's such a poor description um but it's, it's basically like a sort of a process that we see in nature like so much of zanaka's music nature through the lens of mathematics and architecture mapped onto notation um so and basically the three the piece is basically with the exception of the op the very beginning and ending gestures it's three things are happening and of those three main zones, everything, they can be, you know, it's either stasis um, or flux. So you've got the, the glissandi, which are most of the piece. Um, and then all of a sudden you got to put on the brakes and do like these different, like kind of quiet harmo harmonic dyads, which are actually surprisingly the, the hardest part of the piece. Cause it's like mountain biking or something where you have to like, just like whew, you know, all this potential energy that you then have to like really put the brakes on. Um, so it's like these like moments of like cr incredible like dynamism that you just like interrupt with a super soft moment, um, and then you have the like the two voice glissandi like, like um, which he does a lot in his string writing. Um, so that's kind of the shortest thing I can say about it. So I hope that um, he wrote it for Fernando Grillo, the preeminent like contemporary music first kind of experimental bass player in the, like the 60s and 70s um who taught at darmstadt and you know a bunch of pieces read for him um so that, that's why we have the zanakis so thanks fernando props fernando um great so i think that's kind of it in terms of questions and but we want to keep the party going so i think we're going to throw, yeah, throw so a zoom link for you all to come join us even more in this virtual space hold on i need to grab this zoom link real quick so i can send it to meet megan oh um i'm getting some from a, a, a another source i'm getting some questions um okay. my duo partner um, ligament go check us out yeah. all the social medias ligament um annika asks if either of us know any good jokes um my only jokes are pretty profane and i i don't think this is like definitely like not a g-rated crowd necessarily but it's also not my space so i'm a little hesitant to tell my jokes i know i'm thinking about my jokes too and mine are all pretty bad the rest of the questions coming from my little private zone are all um, very intense um, variations on the fun um, uh, screw, Mary kill game. <laughs> so if that's something that sounds like fun to you, join us in the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, join us in the Zoom. So, um, well, yeah, so we're going to grab your drinks. We're just going to hang on Zoom for a while. Um until until we feel I think like, people uh, might start filing in so like just as a conclusion I, you know to kind of go back to the like question number one like um, I mean it's been it was a real honor to be asked um, to do this and especially to do it with Annie um, I don't I can't remember if we talked too much about new music on the point but like you know we had like a 
every two years we get to do something so we got to keep that trend alive um but hopefully it's not in 2022 like yes. hopefully we're going to do something um, if somebody writes writes us a piece so i'm yeah. going to put the bird the burden of that onto you dear dear listener um <laughs> but no it's it's been great to do this um of all the organizations in the world, like Neef North means like an incredible amount to me. So like I, you know, got to give major, major gratitude to Andy and Carrie and, you know, Chris Adler. Um, and of course, like also now Megan, um, like I've, I've done a bunch of new music festivals at this point um, and they all are very near and dear to my heart in different ways, but Neef North is still like super, super special. So if anybody is listening, who's thinking about going or hasn't gone, you know, whatever, you got to do it. You'd be a fool not to. And I, I think one of the reasons we're doing this as a fundraiser is because the festival isn't happening this summer, which of course not. Um, and and while that's like no surprise to anybody, it's still deeply sad. Um, so just one more shout out. If you are in a position to do so, please consider uh, buying a ticket or I think sponsoring a seat um, through the the Dots live, uh, live music. I think there's a link on the dots page for the live music project page um but uh yeah if yeah. you if you have any doubts into your mind um as to whether those dollars are going to good use i can definitely attest that they are same yeah. here yeah thanks so much we gotta end with a high five we practice this we practice this boom right there <laughs> all right i'm gonna go to the post okay. show on obs yeah uh, we're gonna go and see you at the Zoom hang. Thanks right. so much, everyone. Thanks, everybody.